Welcome to the Inconvenient Minority Podcast. I'm your host, Kenny Shu, and joining me today, I've had the pleasure of introducing to you Rob Henderson. Uh, Rob Henderson grew up in foster care, uh, went to the military, and then graduated from Yale and is now a PhD candidate in Cambridge. He is a writer. He has highly praised columns, writing specifically about the luxury beliefs of the elites, social class, race, identity, sex, um, and we'll be touching on a lot of these topics here today, but Rob, it's great to have you. Thank you, Kenny. It's great to be here. Yeah, of course. So, you know, I've, uh, you know, why don't you tell, describe for the audience, you know, your experience growing up in foster care. You were born to, you know, a Korean mother, um, a Korean immigrant mother, and your fa- biological father, I think, left the family, you know, when you were very young. Um, and so you kind of bounced around foster care homes for a while. You know, how was that experience and everything in your childhood? Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. it was really challenging. Uh, so, yeah, my mother came to, to California from South Korea as a young woman. And when I was three years old, she succumbed to a drug addiction. And my father left uh, before that even. So, you know, my, my mother and I, were sort of living in cars and slum apartments around LA. And then she, you know, experienced this addiction problem. I was subsequently taken to foster homes and moved around Los Angeles. And yeah, it was tough, man. I was moving, moving to different schools every three to six months. I ended up living in seven different homes. Some of these homes had, you know, eight or 10 plus foster kids living in them. So I had a lot of foster siblings that were kind of coming and going. I mean, that was, that was really, um, a struggle for me because it, it wasn't just that I wouldn't know what home I would be going to next, but I wouldn't know which of my foster siblings would be leaving and who would be joining us the next day. So it was just a total chaos or sort of a chaotic situation, totally disorderly environment. Um, and yeah, as a consequence, I mean, I was, you know, school was then the last thing on my mind. I was a really poor student. I just had no interest in, in academics. And yeah, it wasn't until much later that I started to take school seriously. Um, but yeah, I, I was adopted when I was uh, uh, sort of later on in my childhood. And my adoptive family, there was a divorce. What, what age? Re- what year? I was, uh, I was about, let's say I was almost eight years old when that happened. Um, but then about a year after that, my adoptive parents... Uh, divorced. And then my adoptive father subsequently severed ties with me. And there was just like, uh, sort of separations, divorces, remarriage. I mean, it was just a totally chaotic situation. So even after I was adopted, the sort of family drama didn't end in my life. So yeah, I'm, oh my uh, gosh. yeah, it was, it was really just a, a rough, uh, uh, sort of youth that I, I had experienced. So that, that, that situation, the sort of experiences that I've had in, in, in foster care, and in these in these sort of uh, you know disorderly and turbulent environments have have shaped a lot of my a lot of my views. So tell me about the foster care system in LA because I've recently been doing a little more research on foster care specifically. First of all, for your for the readers, sorry the listeners, it's seventy five percent women. Foster care is seventy five percent women. Also, the foster care industry itself is very low paying. You know, it's a low low paying industry. And you work with, you know, foster care children who, you know, disproportionately are misbehaved and ill raised. You know, it's this is a dispiriting industry. I don't know if you've gotten any wind of that, you know, while you were in the foster care system. But what was your foster care experience like in terms of the people you were working with? Kenny, when you say 75 percent women, do you mean 75 percent of foster parents or, no, no, seventy-five percent of foster caseload managers. So oh, managers. Like foster, oh, right, right. Yeah. So, so the sort of like social workers yeah, are women. Oh, yeah, workers. that makes sense. I, I, yeah, I wanted to clarify because I sure. think yeah, it's pretty much at least in terms of the kids themselves, the foster kids. I think it's about you know at gender parity, fifty-fifty, roughly. Um, okay. But yeah, yeah, like of course, like it when could. I look back on on my you know the homes I grew up in, it was like fifty percent. Actually, it might have been slightly more, but around 50-50 boys and girls in terms of my foster siblings. And then, yeah, my I had two social workers, both of whom were women. 
Um, one for the most part, like one primary social worker. And then later I had another one, but anyway, I mean, yeah, it's just a, it's just a mess, man. Like the, 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 I mean, to, to think about like what you have to do to be taken from your parents in the first place and then to be put in the homes, like that's already like the kid already experienced like a ton of sort of uh, hardship. And then in the homes themselves, it's even, it's even worse. I mean, like a, a sort of a snapshot or like an example of, of how challenging these environments are. So I was recently looking at data from, uh, the Los Angeles County foster care system and the sort of high school graduation rates in LA County as a whole. And so uh, if you look at LA County as a whole, about 87% of uh, kids graduate from high school. So that's overall 87% of all the students in LA County graduate from high school. And then if you look at the uh, bottom quintile, the sort of the poorest kids in LA, what's the high school graduation rate for them? And it's also 87%. So it's actually not any lower. Poverty doesn't seem to have much of an effect on high school graduation rates um, in LA. But if you look at foster kids, any kid who has ever lived in a foster home, it's 65%. And so, you know, one interpretation of, of these findings is that sort of living in chaos is actually uh, more detrimental in terms of graduation rates than, than being poor. So it's actually, in a way, it's sort of, quote unquote, better to be poor than to sort of live in an uncertain and chaotic environment where you don't know where you're going to live next or who's going to be living with you next. So yeah, I mean, and, and then the, the, the college graduation rates reflect this as well. I mean, if you look at the U.S. as a whole, about uh, well, so overall, it's something like thirty-five percent of of high school students in in the U.S. end up graduating from college later. But for the kids in the bottom economic quintile, so the poorest uh, kids in America, the graduation rate for them for college is eleven percent, and for foster kids, it's three percent. So it's actually you're about four times more likely to graduate from college if you grew up poor than if you grew up in foster care. So it's actually preferable in a sense if you want to graduate from college to, to be sort of raised in a poor family than to be raised in foster care. Um, so yeah, I mean, foster care is like, as bad as it is to be poor in America, foster care is like, you know, that on another level in terms of sort of your your prospects and your educational and economic outcomes, emotional and behavioral. And I mean, all these things, it's just a really, really tough situation for kids. Well, that comports with you know, basically the subjects of all of the guests that I've been talking about on the Inconvenient Minority podcast, because the thing that I've been stressing over and over again on this podcast is that it's not the low income necessarily that causes all of these, you know, poor life outcomes and things like that. It's the certain cultural factors that are associated with these people, but don't specifically derive from low income-ness you know, that creates these life outcomes. And part of it is, you know, the, the, the rate of people living in the foster care system, you know. The thing about your case is fascinating to me. I think it's going to be fascinating to the listeners, too. You clearly <laughs> did not, you clearly bucked the trend somehow in terms of being raised in foster care. Um, you know, and now, you know, you, you later joined the military which we've talked about the military before on this podcast. It's, uh, it is a stability-raising system. It creates stable cultures. Then you went to Yale, and now you're pursuing a PhD in Cambridge. To what part of your life do you attribute the, the, the ability to transcend those supposedly dire circumstances in which you were raised? Yeah, a few years ago, um, well, this was yeah about three years ago, I wrote this op-ed uh, in the New York Times, documenting sort of how I ended up being becoming relatively successful given the turbulence of my my early life, and I really sort of boil it down to to two things. So I mean, basically, one there was a one thing that I noticed was basically um, any time I experienced any kind of stability in my life as a kid and as a young adult, that was when my potential sort of manifested itself, and that's when I started to sort of take my life and my future more seriously. And when there was sort of chaos and instability in my life, then I would quickly revert back to sort of, you know, negative habits, things that would sort of um, sabotage my success or my future. And the other thing is, uh, is personal responsibility, sort of accepting that, you know, it's, it's not my fault that I ended up with this sort of really unfortunate 
uh, sort of hand that I was dealt in terms of my my foster, you know, with the foster care, the homes, the sort of what what family happened to adopt me and all of the subsequent chaos there like that. None of that was my fault as a kid, but no one was going to fix that for me. Um, I started to realize sort of in my later teenage years and in my early 20s uh, and and sort of understanding that, yes, like all of this bad stuff happened to me, but no one's going to fix it. I'm the only one who can really fix it myself. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, th- there's there's a good point to be made. I mean, it, it really is sort of the the, the consequences of, of sort of being really sort of p- poor and impoverished and everything. I mean, that's that's really difficult. And I'm definitely by no means against financial assistance for families and for kids and whatever who are who are struggling. But I think at least as important and, and possibly more so based on the research I've seen is that sort of stability and safe and secure homes for early for, for early environments for, for young kids is is critical as well. Um, and so so you were saying earlier, you know, what, so what was this? You know, I bucked this this trend or whatever. Um, a big part of that was. Um, the fact that I did have like sort of brief and sporadic periods of stability in which I sort of understood what my potential was. And one of the points that I try to make in a lot of my writing is that, you know, you can have kids who are full of potential and who are bright and curious and, you know, sort of destined for something, you know, could potentially be destined for, for a, a pretty good life, but that can all be sort of drowned out and washed away if the kid is in an environment that's that's full of hopelessness and i'm not talking just about poverty not just in terms of sort of materially deprived but sort of socially deprived and emotionally deprived um in terms of sort of lack of parenting lack of oversight the feeling that that no one cares about what i do anyway um yeah so all of those things are 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 important and the other point i want to make here is that it doesn't even matter like to me i think like a lot of the goals that we focus on in terms of what's good for kids um you know, educational outcomes, employment, occupational prestige, all of those things, I think are are secondary concerns to actually like what the subjective experiences of kids living through horrible environments. So people will say, oh, we need to care about foster kids or poor kids or whatever, because they're not graduating from college, or they earn less overall in their lifetimes or whatever. And those are all important things to talk about. But really, I think the reason why those environments are bad for kids is because the kids in them are, are experiencing a lot of emotional pain, but we don't like to talk about that. We'd rather talk about college or whatever. Emotional pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Relationship pain. Um, so, so you would really as- ascribe your ability to get out of these circumstances to this like rugged individualism to like your ability to take care of yourself and personal responsibility? Uh Yes, a hundred percent. No, no, no. Um, like I, I would attribute sort of part of it to that. So it's, it's a few different things. Um, so one, did you have community, like, yeah. were you raised with a religion? No, I wasn't. Um, so, so I was, uh, so shortly after, um, so that, you know, to back up a little bit, my, my mother and my adoptive father, my adoptive mother, and adoptive father, they divorced. There was a bunch of crazy stuff that happened, but then for a brief period in my adolescence, my mother, um, uh, entered a relationship with a woman uh, named Shelly. And so my mother and Shelly together sort of raised me uh, from sort of like middle school years up until early high school. And that was when my grades improved. That was when I started taking my life more seriously, started thinking about college. Um, but then there was more family tragedies that happened after that. And then my grades uh, plummeted. And from there, like college was never an option. And that's when I joined the military. And then once again, in the military, I experienced that stability, that sense of calm, that predictability. And then that's when I started thinking more about, about my future once again, and again, started thinking about college. So it's not just this sort of, you know, like pull myself up by my bootstraps, whatever, but it was like the environment around me allowed me to sort of take my future seriously and start thinking more about what I wanted to do and allowed me to and sort of indulge and pursue my curiosities. Yeah. So you were in a, like a relatively stable environment. Did you like see yourself at least as like relatively high on the intelligence hierarchy? Like when you were growing up, like you looked around and you were like, you know, I feel like I'm a pretty smart guy compared to my peers. Um, not really. I never thought of myself as smart. I mean, I, I have like these, so I'm writing a memoir and I'm almost finished. And I, I, I've distinctly sort of, I document these, these like moments I had as a kid of like 
interacting with with what I thought of as my smart friends, you know, kids in my class who would get straight A's and who'd raise their hand all the time and who who would like do the extra credit, even though they didn't have to, you know, like teachers would sometimes say like, oh, here's this makeup assignment for extra credit if you want to do it. And like all the straight A students would do that extra credit, even though they didn't have to. And like, I remember just being blown away by this. Um, and it wasn't until uh, I took the, the ASVAB my senior year of high school, which is the standardized test, sort of similar to the SAT. You know, I, I showed up like hungover, hungry, dehydrated. Like I, I partied the night before. Like I was just a mess in, in high school, man. I, I showed up like totally unprepared for this test. And then a couple of weeks later, I met with uh, the military recruiter to go over my results. And he was like, yeah, these are really high scores. Like, you know, he was like telling me how, how well I did in this test. And I was like, what? Like, I, I really didn't know that I, you know, thought of myself as like the smart person. I thought like, you know, when I, when I occasionally I would work hard and get good grades, but I never, you know, looked around and thought like, I'm, you know, I have this high IQ or something. It was, it was never like that. Um, I was very much just like kind of a troublemaker with my friends. Wow. Wow. That is so interesting. Um, I think you have a really, you know, incredible background um, going into college and everything like that. And so the, this next part about what I wanted to talk to you about is about college. Um, and you had a you had a circuitous route into college. You started off in the military. That's so you got the attention of the military recruiter with your high scores, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's it's funny. Um, the military has a very standardized process for admitting people and everything like that. You have to be physically apt. You have to be intelligently apt and everything like that. It's very standardized. Um, and I, I think it probably, you know, do you think that the military experience that you had and, and you, you, you keep emphasizing stability and I'm guessing the mm -hmm. military experience that you had was like a particularly stable part of your life where you were able to kind of indulge in various curiosities and eventually make the decision to go to college. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the military, like it, it's, it creates this structure to where you, you, you don't have to worry about anything other than the job. Um, you know, because I mean, obviously like sort of being, a a productive person in the military is critical. And so they basically remove all the friction in your life, except to just focus on the job. So, you know, you get, you sort of get paid regularly, you know, where you're going to live, like all of this stuff, like, you know, and, and then for, you know, when I rose up in the ranks a little bit, I was able to get a, get a house with some friends off base, off the military base. And they give you like a pretty generous stipend to live off base. And like, basically, so my, my sort of financial worries were taken care of, um, I sort of like knew what, what my life was going to be like from that point on. And so it was, it was really in that sort of stable environment that I, that I was able to sort of understand my potential and think more about what I wanted to do next. And yeah, I mean, the, the, of course, like there are selection effects as well. Like you mentioned, there's, they sort of select for a certain like minimal level of competence or ability, both physically and mentally. I mean, there was a kid I knew in high school who was, um, who was trying to join with me. Uh, he was this athletic kid, um, you know, more than anything in the world, he wanted to enlist. And I remember he took the ASVAB with me and he failed. And the recruiter gave him like all of this uh, material, study material, prep material, whatever, kind of worked with him sometimes too on it. And I think he took it like six months later and he got the same exact score um, and he couldn't join. And so, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but like the military, it does a good job of sort of like pinpointing people who have potential and, you know, sort of scooping them up and, and whatever. But there are people who, um, who, yeah, couldn't, couldn't uh, necessarily make that cut. And, and for those people, I, I you know, think those people are worth thinking about too, that not everyone can sort of follow the same path that I did where like, oh, you know, you get this high score and then you have this sort of upward mobility. Some people can't necessarily follow that path. And those people are worth thinking about too, about like how they can live a good life. Right. Well, the reason why they have those scores and the minimum requirement is because they want to make sure that you're actually going to help the military. You know, yep. I think the military did studies that said people who fall below a certain score on these tests, like are actually are counterproductive towards the overall effectiveness of their brigade. You know? Yeah, yeah. Mil uh, Jordan Peterson has talked uh, a little bit about the military standardized testing, right. and and uh, and, and I Robert think yeah, appeared a lot on of Jordan heard Peterson's that. podcast uh, last. I mean, uh, a few few weeks ago. So, but go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Jordan Peterson. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's 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 discussed this. I think those videos have um, gotten a lot of attention about his observations about sort of the minimal thresholds. I mean, at least so so the Air Force would, where where I joined, the minimum percentile threshold was the thirty sixth percentile. I don't actually know like what the the sort of how that that matches to to specific IQ number or whatever, but that's sort of the the the, the floor. The lowest you can score is the thirty sixth percentile to enlist, and I think it's like thirty first percentile for the for the army, but basically. Basically, like if you're in the bottom, roughly the bottom one third of test takers for the standardized test, the military you know, just won't let you in. And yeah, so so that's also sort of what's um, what's going on in terms of like, why is the military the kind of, you know, mostly productive and efficient and and functional organization that it is, is because they select for, for certain kinds of people. So after you joined the military, military, you, I guess you applied and and you, you got into Yale. Um, is that what happened? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so towards the end of my enlistment, um, I, I took a few classes at a community college. Um, yeah, got, you know, good grades. I took the SAT finally. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I had to go to this, like, so I was, I was stationed in Germany at this time. And they have a, an American high school on the military base for like the kids of of like sort of the senior officers and senior NCOs and whatever, and um, and so I had to like go to this American high school on the base. It was so awkward, man. I was twenty three, I think, and I showed up at like seven forty five or whenever like this test was with a bunch of like sixteen and seventeen year olds. I felt super awkward uh, sitting in like one of those like weird little like you know high school desks with like the little tiny uh, desk attached to it like the chair with a little mini and i'm like squeezing in there like oh, i can barely fit in this thing and so i took the sat and uh, yeah between my community college grades my sat score and like sort of the, the package that i put together um yale took a took a chance on me and uh, and yeah I'm, I'm pretty grateful for that um i have a lot of criticisms of elite universities but but i am sort of uh uh, thankful that that they were willing to sort of take this risk on this person with a very sort of uh, scattered high school transcript. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I do a lot of work on, I mean, you know this, I do a lot of work on Harvard, Yale, elite culture, uh, their admissions process, race, that kind of stuff. And I think we're going to get into some of these topics. We can't possibly get into everything. But so let's let's talk about Yale. Okay, so let's you come up with one of the one of the articles and the ideas that have made you somewhat notorious is this luxury belief idea. And it's and it, it stems, I think, and you have this perspective because you come from a poor foster care background, and suddenly you get put into Yale University, where you're surrounded by upper class, upper middle class, you know, basically uh, functional little elites. And these people have very different beliefs that, that you ever, you know, that you ever had, you know. And um, one of the things that you talked about, I think, on the Jordan Peterson podcast was, for example, the belief in colorblindness, right? I mean, colorblindness has become a part where, like, most working and middle class people are like, yeah, I don't see race. I don't treat anybody differently because of their race. But only the elite class is, I guess, intelligent and uh, is intelligent enough to understand that even though they say that, that's not what they really mean. They have implicit and unconscious biases and they see color even though they don't see color. And so um, that is that is one example of sort of the disconnect between middle and working class beliefs and values and upper elite working class beliefs and values. And what do you what do you think is like the fundamental difference between you know, the upper middle or, you know, the upper elite class at Yale that you saw. And like, if you had to explain that this paradigm shift in like one sentence or just one trait, what would it be? Well, I mean, it would definitely be my luxury beliefs idea. So luxury beliefs, I have defined as ideas and opinions that confer status on the upper class while often inflicting costs on the lower classes. And there are a variety of sort of examples I can get into, but just to ex sort of lay out the idea very briefly. Um, so in the past, you know, sort of the upper classes would display their social status with material goods. This has been documented by sort of old school sociologists and economists, Thorsten Veblen, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, and some others, 
who basically sort of show like how the the upper classes back in the day would sort of wear fancy clothes and, you know, sort of tuxedos, evening gowns. They take up expensive hobbies. And this was a way for them to show off their their high social rank. Well, fast forward to today, and I, I, it's it's become, I think, a little bit less uh, prestigious or a little bit more sort of vulgar or gauche to display your position with material goods, at least among sort of Ivy League educated people who go to elite colleges. Often they sort of dress down. There's not like this desire to sort of stand out. Uh, I, I actually... Um, noticed the other, well, this was about two weeks ago, I was on a flight and I walked through first class and I noticed that the people in first class dressed exactly the same as the people in coach. Whereas I, about 40 years ago, this wouldn't have been the case. Like you would have been able to tell like which passengers were about to get on the plane to first class and which ones were going to sit in coach. Today, they look about the same. So how are the sort of upper classes uh, distinguishing themselves? They're doing it with their sort of the beliefs, uh, beliefs that sort of get them to stand apart from sort of conventional and ordinary, like you were saying, middle class and working class kinds of people. The colorblindness one. So this is kind of a new idea that popped into my head. I mean, it's just it's just fascinating to me how um, when I arrived at Yale, how um, how much sort of racial consciousness there was and this sort of emphasis on identity and where you come from and sort of what uh, what ethnic category you belong to. Whereas when I grew up, it wasn't really like that. Um, so I grew up in so after my foster homes in L.A., my, my, my foster siblings, by the way, were like very sort of whatever ethnically diverse. Like I was usually like one, maybe sometimes there was like another Asian kid. And then there were like a few white kids, you know, black kids, a- Hispanic kids. Like, yeah, it was just like a hodgepodge of different people. And then when I got to Red Bluff, it was like mostly working class, white and Hispanic people, a few black people, you know, a couple Asians. Um, I remember, uh, and this is like, sort of like, yeah, run uh, the median household income in Red Bluff when I grew up there was $27,000 a year. Um, so definitely like sort of on the, the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. And yeah, it was, it, it was just like Reese was not treated as a big deal there. And then in the military, which I think is like sort of a more middle class or lower middle class, at least on the enlisted side, uh, that, that kind of like uh, organization, although like there's actually been a study on this, that basically the recruits that enlist in the military tend to disproportionately come from the middle class. Um, again, race was not treated as a big deal there. You were both mostly, mostly judged on your competence and your ability to get the job done, what your rank was. And then I get to Yale and it's like, you know, very much sort of this racialized environment and people are very preoccupied with identity politics and, and of course, not just race, but also gender and all these things. And I was just sort of blown away by this, like, okay, I remember sort of thinking that like we were supposed to be like judging people as individuals and not as whatever member of whatever group they come from. And to me, this is um, a sort of a circulation of of beliefs to signal status such that in the past, um, back when America was a very racist society, it was the upper classes who were championing colorblindness and judging people as individuals and not by the category they happen to be a member of. And once that belief trickled down throughout society and to the point where uh, sort of the working and middle class accept that as a, as a good ideal, um, now the upper classes are like, okay, well, now how do I distinguish myself once again from those people? Well, they're now reintroducing uh, sort of race and, uh, and all these other kinds of identity divisions to distinguish themselves once again, and once again, making race uh, a prominent part of our everyday lives so that they can signal, like, I am not, you know, one of you little people who don't care about race, we should care about race. And by not caring about race, you're just revealing your own ignorance or your own lack of education or sophistication. And you think that that, and you think that this will eventually trickle down into the middle class, this sort of racial consciousness? I hope not. I think it would be a very bad idea. It would be a bad thing. Yes. If so this um, is part of your luxury beliefs thesis, then. Right. Yeah, exactly. Upper class beliefs hurt lower and middle class people. Yes. Yes. If this belief were to trickle down, I, my prediction is that it would not go well because, I mean, just any kind of ethnically diverse society that's ever existed uh, once, mm-hmm. like w- when they focus on differences, things tend to go very poorly for them. When they focus on similarities, they can usually work together. Um, mm-hmm. There's a great um, uh, book by Roy Baumeister, the, the great psychologist. He wrote a book called Evil, uh, Inside Human Violence and Cruelty, which I highly recommend. It's a great book. Um, and he uh, states this clearly that, you know, in the history of the world, whenever you have people who focus, like different groups of people who focus on their differences, it almost inevitably uh, 
um, gives rise to conflict and violence and all of these horrible things. But when they focus on their similarities, then they're able to sort of overlook and sort of come together and cooperate and and um, sort of build a sense of cohesion. And he he notes that America is actually sort of going, it's, it's sort of betting on the opposite outcome of what's historically been true by focusing on differences. Um, I, I think I agree with that. I think it's it's probably not uh, not a great great direction we're headed uh, in terms of sort of highlighting our differences. So uh, this is where I'm going to challenge your luxury beliefs a little bit. Um, I mean, you said that it was an upper class thing that is going to harm the lower class to believe in race, but then you also said you know 50 years ago the, it was, the upper class thing was to believe in color blindness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that trickled down too. So it was that bad then? was color blindness oh. bad oh. then? You know. So yeah, yeah. So that's a it's it's interesting point. So so I'm not saying that every belief that the upper class holds is a luxury belief, or that every belief that they hold is harmful. Uh, the luxury beliefs idea is a specific category uh, of beliefs that the elites happen to hold that that are harmful. So so they have many different beliefs. Some of them are good. Some of them are sort of uh, neither good nor bad, and some of them are bad. Uh, the luxury beliefs idea are specifically the bad <laughs> ideas, I, or many of them are bad, that that end up inflicting harm. But of course, like there are you know good ideas, like like the colorblindness idea that that often start with the upper class that I that I think have sort of trickled down and have been have been uh, sort of beneficial. But then I don't really see what the point that you're making is with luxury beliefs, then because I mean, if some luxury be- if some ideas of the upper class are good, some ideas are bad, then all that seems to me is that some ideas are good and some ideas are bad, you know. But are, yeah. are you talking yeah. specifically about like? I mean, how do you, how would you define a bad belief? You know. So, so th- specifically in, in the definition are the sort of ideas that can inflict harm on the the lower classes. So when 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 there's a fashionable belief that arises among the upper class or the upper middle class, um, I think it's important for them to. Th- think and reflect on, you know, if this belief is to be broadcast and if it's to become popular and sort of spread throughout society, uh, what are the consequences and sort of the second order consequences of, of this idea being sort of adopted and acted upon by society as a whole? And so, so of course, like, you know, for example, in the 19th century, the abolitionist movement, you know, to, to eliminate slavery, that was proportion- disproportionately championed by sort of upper class people. And in that case, I think they did reflect very hard on like, what are the, you know, of course, it's like a great idea. Um, and I think uh, oftentimes today and sort of more, more um, in more modern times, a lot of the elites don't necessarily reflect on on what would be the consequences of, of certain beliefs that they have. They know that in the moment it feels good. It makes them look like a good person. It sort of elevates their status among their fellow upper class peers. But what happens when it trickles down? And that's that's the point that I that I'd like to sort of highlight and, and sort of remind people who uh, live in affluence, who are sort of highly educated um that you wield disproportionate influence in society, whether you want to believe that or not, it's just true. If you graduate from a top university and you have any kind of platform or any kind of sort of social cachet, you are inevitably going to be more influential than the average person. And so it's worth reflecting on what beliefs you broadcast. So it's a, so it's a, it's a belief that, in, that to the person saying it, if their upper class enhances their status, mm-hmm. but if it's mm-hmm. actually put into practice... Right, you know, would hurt the lower class. Yes, and and if it's put into practice by the upper class, it can hurt them too. But my argument is that it doesn't have nearly the same effect. Um, if you're an upper class person, you go to a top college, you're economically comfortable, you're you're more buffered from whatever the catastrophic consequences of your actions are. I mean, even something like drug addiction, right? Like if you sort of broadcast like, hey, you should do a bunch of drugs. Well, if you're an upper class person, you do a bunch of drugs, you can afford doctors, you can afford therapy and rehab and all of these things that can help you. But if the lower classes adopt this idea that you should try every drug you see, then of course, like this is just a simple example, but of course, like they are going to have a much different experience with that kind of belief and and acting upon that belief than the upper class would have. Is affirmative action a luxury belief? Um, hmm. I guess, I mean, I guess it would, it would depend, but perhaps in the long term it is, um, because I can see both arguments, right? Like I think the, the proponents of affirmative action believe that it's helping disadvantaged people, 
but the detractors or sort of the the critics argue that it it actually doesn't help them and actually if you if if I, if I recall you may have more uh more knowledge of the findings than I do but my understanding especially sort of at at the top tier schools is that affirmative action instead of sort of helping the least advantaged it actually ends up attracting sort of the already economically advantaged people um so a lot of the sort of black and hispanic students that go to ivy league schools um the majority of them do tend to come from sort of well off families and it's not really the kinds of people who come from sort of low income situations that are sort of um the beneficiaries of these programs i want to give you the the reason why like i i think that your luxury belief idea is sort of attractive to me personally mm-hmm. uh and to, to the book that i write which is called an inconvenient minority so there's this belief among Yale Asian undergrads, Asian American second generation undergrads, Harvard undergrads, Cornell, you know, that kind of thing, that the Asian community is more privileged than the black community. This is like how they justify discrimination against Asians uh, in favor of blacks because they're like, well, the, the black community is more marginalized than the Asian community. Um, and it's, I guess it's, it's easy for them to say because it makes them look nice and woke and it, um, it makes them seem all moral and virtuous. Like, man, you know, the black community gave us everything, you know, we should fight for them. I'm willing to sacrifice, you know, on behalf, I think the Asian community should sacrifice on behalf of the black community. But of course, none of them would ever sacrifice their admittance spot at Yale, <laughs> for a black person. Um, And this, to me, represents the epitome of what a luxury belief looks like. Interesting. Because, because, I mean, you should, you need to read the story of Eileen Huang, who is a Yale English major, um, Mm -hmm. who wrote in this blog called ChineseAmerican.org, where she says, we owe everything to the black community. And anti not only that, anti-black racism is embedded in my Asian American community. And the way that she cites that is, you know, she cites some isolated, you know, Asian grandma incidents pointing out, you know, that you shouldn't date black people or something like that. And sure, I mean, yeah, of course there are like Asian grandmas who have those beliefs, but they're like black grandmas who don't, who don't like, they're black grandpas who don't like Asian people either. And to mm-hmm. think that like, Asian people have somehow uh, universally have have had it better than black people in this country. I think that's sort of the definition of kind of a cultural arrogance. Like you clearly have not seen people in Chinatown in New York City in Flushing, or you clearly haven't seen the Korean shopkeep owners in Los Angeles. Um, this is this is where like I become attracted to the idea that there are people who will assert beliefs simply for virtue of their own status. Um, Beliefs that like are they're willing to even put down their entire community just to assert this kind of virtue signaling status. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I wrote a whole article about this um, last year called "Why Young Asians Are Now Woke," and, and it's an unheard uh, website. And I basically sort of discussed this idea at length of like what's going on here. Um, you know, like wh- why are why are sort of so many young Asian Americans uh, adopting these sort of like woke beliefs and why are they like often especially the higher up the education scale you go among asian americans the more in favor of affirmative action they are why are they more in favor of diversity initiatives and so on even though you know there is sort of documented evidence that these elite schools actually sort of discriminate against asian americans and so what's going on here and and i basically make this case that like you know there's a reason why the higher up you go in education the more they're in favor of these things is because that's how you sort of fit in with the sort of upper class american culture like that's what you have to do i mean so so then i sort of document sort of the like what like what class means in America and maybe in other countries too, but, you know, specifically in the U S context, um, if you want to join the sort of upper class or the elites in America, it's not enough to just have the same resume as them. You also have to have the same beliefs and opinions on social and political issues. And so if you want to, yeah, it's actually an indicator of assimilation in a way. I mean, this Eileen person, it sounds like she is doing her best to assimilate. That's what you have to believe now to rise in America. If you want to sort of be, um, sort of praised and validated and climb up, you know, people who, you know, uh, groups that that sort of attend Ivy League schools and sort of 
uh, live in that sort of strat of society, you have to have those kinds of beliefs, um, even though often it is detrimental to sort of working class Asian Americans. Um, so, so of course, like if you are an Asian American student and you get into Harvard or Yale or whatever, then you can talk all day about how great it is that they have these diversity initiatives. And even though they, you know, even if it's not their conscious, um, even if it's not conscious, they do as a, as just a result of what they do, they, they discriminate against Asian Americans. Um, but right. they're not going to be yeah, affected by those At the same time beliefs. though, you wrote in this article unheard that you're not sure if you agree with that Harvard discriminates against Asian Americans. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I said, I disagree about whether it's, it's uh, it's a good or a bad thing. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. now, so explain that to me, like how, how, why you feel that, that, that the discrimination against Asian Americans might be a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how it would be a good thing. And I, so, so one of the points that I make is that like, as I've sort of uh, been ensconced in these institutions and been around so many people who are so in support of these things, it's possible that just through osmosis, I've been sort of conditioned now because when I first started, like if you had asked me the first day that I set foot at Yale, uh, what do you think about discriminative, you know, whatever, discriminating against Asians, affirmative action, diversity, all this stuff, I would have said, like, I think you should just judge people based on whether they are sort of the best, right? Like you should take the best people you can, regardless of what they look like or whatever. And now I'm less certain of that. And it could be through sort of social conditioning, right? Like well, that's one possibility. Well, wh um, why, why rationally are you less certain of this? Now, rationally, uh, I... I'm not entirely sure it's um, it's feasible for so so you've probably seen some of the data on this that you know if if all the you know if Harvard and Yale and Princeton and whatever if they were to take students solely on sort of test scores and grades and whatever then they would suddenly become like forty or fifty percent Asian um, which I think is like what what uh, what Caltech looks like or some of these schools that do sort of mostly judge students or, or applicants based on their their sort of merits. Um, I'm not sure how feasible it is for the future ruling class to, um, to look so different than, than the population as a whole. Um, you mean you're not sure if the future working ruling class would look, should look more, is feasible to look more Asian than to look more white? Uh, yes. And, and the reason for this is that I'm not sure like how the population, the general population would feel about this. I don't know if the sort of like legitimacy of the ruling class would would maintain if um you know be because people don't think now this that, way right like normal this, people don't understand yeah go ahead now this is a luxury belief that Maybe. is a, you just articulated a luxury belief because you assume that the ordinary american cares about what the elite looks like it's uh, may maybe which which you just articulated 20 minutes ago most americans really don't care what you look like. And I personally don't care what the elite look like. I personally care if the elite are performing the function that the elite perform the function of. I mean, yeah. look at, look yeah. at Great Britain, you know, look mm. at you, you live in Great Britain right now. Like half of the, half of the elite spots in Great Britain are allocated to Indians, you know? Oh, is that and right? That, yeah. Middle Eastern people. And it's like, most of the people there don't care. You know, okay. they just okay. they just care whether they're going to get their paycheck, you know. Mm -hmm. So this 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 that is a luxury belief. <laughs> no, no, may, maybe maybe it is. I mean, I I'm I'm open to the idea that that it and would fact, work. It's funny because the only people that would care under the framework that you just said are probably other Harvard and Yale educated <laughs> elites who are very race conscious already. <laughs> that's that's an interesting point. And and maybe. But that's that's also a problem, too. Because you also don't want to have like a lot of, um, I mean, maybe you've read some of Peter Turchin's work, but you don't want to have sort of aspirational elites who are bitter and who feel that they, you know, don't have a seat at the table, right? Like people who are sort of competent and people who are ambitious. And if they feel that the sort of like, they're not going to be able to succeed through ordinary means. But, but again, um, like this well, is also a, an interesting another, question too, because a lot of the Asian you, Americans may not be able to ahead, ahead. enter these schools too. So because I've seen this happen too, where like very, uh, very smart, very competent and ambitious uh, Asian kids apply to these elite schools and they don't get in, even though they should have gotten in. So then yeah. there's this question of where are those people going to end up? So like either like there's no perfect answer to this, but I think it's um, 
like wherever they end up like yeah i I don't know like regardless like it's almost like a a zero-sum game in terms of like the number of seats at these elite schools and so every single choice you make is going to have some kind of positive and a negative consequence and i'm not sure which like which option would be the sort of least detrimental that's well that's that's the other luxury belief that you hold The, the the assumption within your entire argument is that there is a one-to-one correlation, a direct correlation between admittance to Harvard and Yale and your future as an elite, as if Harvard and Yale cultivate and carve up the next generation of elites. And that, that's, that itself is, of course, um, and so that's why you're concerned about what the elite looks like because you think that, or what the class at Harvard looks like, because you think that there's a one-to-one correlation between what Harvard looks like and what the next generation of elites look like. Well, then why would anyone uh, be concerned right about wrong, affirmative action? Then, that's if that's not the case, that that's if it's not the case that 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 those are the schools that shape the future ruling class, then why would anyone care that they discriminate against Asian Americans, or why would you care that they discriminate well, if that's not I, where the future ruling class tends to tends to be educated? Well, here's where I, here's why I care because there's no question that Harvard and Yale are are at the top of the hierarchy in at least one respect, which is. Educa- which at least one respect, really at least two respects. One is education, the other is politics. They're at the top of the hierarchy there, and their beliefs inform and trickle down into elite gifted and talented programs, which are now discriminating against Asians, you know, fort- you know um, uh, magnet schools, those kinds of things. And then that leaks into identity politics and critical race theory, Uh, that are informing the politics of our current generation. So that's why I care about, you know, Harvard specifically and Yale specifically. Um, But but the future elite, right? I mean, the the future elite is not just a political elite. It's not just a educational elite. It's, it's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a business elite, you know, a cultural elite, a sports elite that, that, that does not come from Harvard, that, that is not negotiated by that. So, in that sense, I think Harvard is overplaying its its hand a little bit in in sort of inscribing the idea that that they are the generators of the next generation of of elites in this country. They're 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 the inscribers of a certain subset and a certain segment, but not not all of the elites. Right. And so that's why I think Harvard should be held to the same constitutional principles that every other institution in America is held to. Which is they should be they should not discriminate on the basis of race. You know, it's it's to me Harvard's just like I don't I don't care if you're Harvard I don't care if you're business you shouldn't dis- uh, you shouldn't discriminate on the basis of race and I think that's what most Americans believe. Yes, yeah, yeah, and and so so these schools, I mean, regardless of of whether I mean I, I agree with you that there are different kinds of elites, but these are the schools that a lot of people pay attention to. By and large, these are the schools that sort of the, the the sort of the brightest kids with the best grades and whatever. Like these are the schools that they tend to want to go to, and so people pay a lot of attention to them, and that, that's why there's this sort of preoccupation, maybe not from you, but from many other people, about what their admissions practices are and who they decide to let in and who they don't. And yeah, yeah I mean, it's uh, it's an interesting question, well, and, and, and you I'm have also me preoccupied with it. <laughs> yeah, and and, and, and I, I think it's an interesting it. question. Yeah, with um with whether or not um whether or not it would be sort of feasible and whether it would it would sort of affect the the country at all in any way if they were to sort of just eliminate all of the sort of manipulations and tweaking that they're doing to to get uh, a certain kind of class in terms of demographics and if they just sort of based it strictly on test scores and merit and whatever Uh um if well, say Harvard was fifty percent, perspective that's uncontroversial. Yeah. It's absolutely feasible. They could do well, it this well, year. Oh sure, sure. I think they could do it, but I, I mean, in terms of like feasibility for the country, like would would there be any sort of detrimental outcome one way or the other in any in any way for them to do this? Um, there was an interesting article uh, by. I don't think it would. I think it would be a, a, a better outcome um, because uh, now uh, you're admitting. Now you're giving resources to the most meritorious. Possibly. Basis of um, race. And also, you're you're de incentivizing the racial victimhood industry. That would where be people, good. Where, and I think that that's one of the primary consequences of this, which would be greatly beneficial for society. 
so there's a great article uh, a few years ago from Malcolm Gladwell called Getting In, specifically about, I think the subtitle is The Logic of Ivy League Admissions. And towards the end, he makes a pretty provocative statement. It was in 2005 when he wrote this, I think. So he, he probably couldn't write it exactly the same way today. He'd have to use more coded language. But he basically said that, um, you know, if Harvard had too many Asians, it wouldn't be Harvard. Uh, meaning that the sort of social cachet that it has, the sort of uh, prominence and and respect, and pres- all, all this stuff, right? Like, it would be a different kind of school. It wouldn't be the same Harvard that we know if it were to be 50% Asian. Um, I'm not sure if that's true. Um, I think a lot of people at Harvard probably secret believe, secretly do believe that that's true. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know. So, so I'm reading this uh, this interesting book on on wasps, which I, you're probably familiar with this term. But for the listeners, it's uh, the wasps is a sort of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and these were sort of the elites of the sort of early and mid 20th century America. A subset of them, right? A yeah. subset of them, right? And and these are the people who who predominated at at the Ivy League schools. And one of the points that the author makes uh, in his book is just it's just called wasps, um, is that they, the way that they set up their institutions is that they wanted different kinds of people to intermingle. Uh, so they wanted sort of old money, the sort of old money families who actually didn't have money anymore, but they still had the family name, right? Like they were sort of economically on the decline, but they still had this strong name and the strong sort of social recognition. They wanted those people to interact with these people who had new money, these sort of new, nouveau riche people who had a lot of money, but they didn't have much social cachet. And they wanted these people to intermingle and come together. And this is sort of like what gave their clubs and these universities and whatever, all of their organizations that they formed, uh, the sort of brand and and status power that they had and i think like the schools are still doing that to this day so if they were to just focus on one kind of 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 status one kind of of idea of of who should enter these schools which is just the highest test scores and the highest grades um, they they could arguably be missing out on on all kinds of other kinds of people. My friend Razib Khan has written about this too, about like what Harvard is trying to do, and they're basically trying to get the elites from every kind of um, of of activity and and uh, whatever like like family and and idea that you can have, right? And so. So, you know, athletes, for example, like, is there any reason why an athlete should get any kind of, of um, uh, should be shown any kind of favoritism in admissions for an institution of higher learning? Probably not. But it makes Harvard look cool to have athletes, well, right? Well, I, I mean, you, at this point, you're making an assertion that Harvard should not be a primarily academic institution. Oh, I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but this is just what they, in practice, what they end up doing. Well, this this is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. If Harvard is, if, if Harvard's job is now to actually cultivate elites, social elites, and socialize them, then they're not a primarily academic institution anymore. Mm-hmm. They become mm-hmm. no different from in just another country club. And you know what country clubs don't get? They don't get 501c3 status. Mm. Well, so, actually, I 100% agree with that. They Harvard should be taxed. Able to assert what it does, you know, is that it says it's a primarily academic institution. That's what it puts on its 501c3. That's why we give them huge tax breaks. That's why they have $40 billion of untaxed <laughs> endowment in this country today. It should be taxed. And, okay, good. Well, um, and now... Now you're making the assertion, actually, you know, Harvard's uh, Harvard's purpose is not really academic. It's actually social. It's actually a country club. And I'm like, OK, fine. Then let's call Harvard for what it is. It's a mm-hmm. country club. And let's treat Harvard for what it is. Yeah. Well, Harvard itself, you know, there's a lot of double think in these institutions where, you know, they, they want to call, them, you know, and, and to a large degree, they are whatever, like they, they have classes, they have professors doing research and all this stuff. But in terms of like the undergrads who enter these schools, I mean, let's let's be honest, it is is it, it is like, you know, at, at least as much a country club as it is uh, an institution of higher learning. So so, yeah, I'm 100 percent in favor of taxing the endowment. And and in some ways, like, look, like there I, I don't like that these institutions are like I don't like that they have the prominence that they have. I mean, I went through so so when I was writing my memoir and like and, and just like a lot of the writing, I. I went through a period of sort of resentment that the only reason why, like when I talk about sort of foster care and childhood issues and all this stuff, the only reason why people care about what I'm saying is because I went to Yale. Like, that's not right. You know, there are a lot of kids who have a lot or a lot of people who went through hardship. You really think the only reason why people care about what you say is because you went to Yale and not because your writing is actually good? 
the only reason why people sort of discovered my writing and and all this stuff, like, yeah, I, I think a, a large part wow, of it. It's not, not the only true. reason. It's not that's the only not reason. True. I had no idea you went to Yale before I discovered your writing. I just liked your newsletter because you talked about sex and dating and social <laughs> hierarchies of human nature. And I was like, this is pretty cool. Uh, I didn't care that you went to Yale. And furthermore, I didn't go to Yale. I went to Davidson College. I just started writing articles and people liked me for what I did. And then I got a book deal for it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, also, maybe if I went to Yale, maybe it would have been slightly easier for me to get my book de- deal. But I don't think people cared about my writing because I went to one university or not. I mean, that's a that. that I mean, that's great. But I, I, I think that had I, like, it, it's just undeniable that not not necessarily everyone, but. But many people right. would not have who, who, uh, who so the so the New people? York Times, for example, right. like the, the they, New York they, Times. they wouldn't have accepted my writing if I uh, if I hadn't gone to a certain kind of school. There are other places too, in all likelihood. Um, even even the way that um, yeah yeah, I mean, there were just a lot of things that would have gone differently for me. I'm not saying like no one would have discovered my writing or that it would have been you know like no one would know who I am or something like that. But it definitely made a difference in terms of like how I was able to to sort of get the attention of certain people and sort of alert them to what's going on in in the foster care system and what's I mean, going on with, with kids. Do you have proof that if that if you didn't go to Yale, no one would have cared, or no one that you thought were was important would have cared? I mean, what do you mean by proof? I mean, I think it's I mean, it's just like do you have somebody saying to you, "Man, I really liked your writing, but dang, dude, if you didn't go to Yale, I would no have one." Kenny, you know that no one's going to say that, but it's just the case that this is just how it is. And it's not even necessarily like, what do you mean it's oh, just you, the case that this is how you, it is? How do you know this? So it's not, so if you, no one's going to say that. No one's going to say, oh, yeah, I'm not going to publish. Yeah, oh, you no went to say it. it. <laughs> no one's going to say that. But, so then but, how do you but know it's this? not even just the, um, it's not even just the brand name of the school or whatever. It's also, the kind of people that it puts you in touch with, the kind of people that you're around. Like, it's just a different kind of environment. And yeah, it's just, I don't like that that's the case. Anyway, like I said, I went through like this period of resentment that like, oh, the only reason like this person is talking to me or the only, like, this is like a large part of the reason why. And it's not right. This is the case. I mean, there are people out there who have also had like the same kind of experiences as me and no one's listening to them. And that's, that's not right. And like, yeah, I mean, maybe they could, they could also have taken the same exact route I did uh, or whatever, um, but not gone to Yale, gone to a different school or whatever. But yeah, I think that certain kinds of people are more likely to listen to you depending on what kind of school you go to. Maybe not you, maybe not the people listening to us right now, but there are people who, who think that way, especially people uh, who attend these kinds of schools. Um, they judge you uh, for better or worse, and, and mostly for the worse, I think, uh, in terms of sort of where you went to school or, or sort of like what your credentials are. Um, yeah, you know what I would call those people? Hmm. Idiots. Hmm. Yes, yes. To judge but, people on some silly credential or some credential instead of to judge them on their merit, that's idiotic. Yes, yes. And that's that's the way that a lot of these people think. Um, and so... And, and, and there's... And, and yeah. you... You know, I didn't go to Yale. I didn't go to Harvard. I applied to Princeton. I got rejected. Um, I applied to Wharton Business School. I got rejected. Um... I went to Davidson College with a scholarship, and I said, and there was a temptation in me to believe, man, I must be cut out from all of this opportunity because I didn't go to Harvard and to Yale. But then I just sucked it up, and I just realized, heck, well, if there is, so be it, but I'm put in the situation I have, and I'm going to start writing, and I'm going to start doing what I love. And what I found was it was hard to place my first article, but when I placed my first article, it was easier to get my second article. Mm -hmm. And after that, it became easier and easier. And I moved up every publication. I started off with some conservative publications. I moved up. I got to New York Post. Finally got in the Wall Street Journal. I got a book deal. I really don't think your elite credentials really define your ability to get opportunities oh not at all no 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 no. it's it's just a it's just different man like of course like there's different ways you can you can sort of find success in your life and the kind of school you go to 
may give you like a very slight advantage or whatever in certain instances. But of course, like there are like most people who are successful do not end up like do not go to like certain kinds of schools or whatever. That's just not the case. So I agree with that. Um, but look, like I, I, I guess what I'm saying is the kind of people, in my opinion, who need to hear certain criticisms the most are not necessarily going to accept those criticisms from people outside of their sphere. So if I want to discuss the sort of shortcomings and the narrow mindedness of people who come from elite colleges, um, it, it just helps that I happen to have been around those people and sort of understand the way that they think. And, and if I, because here's what they do, man, like there's a lot of language games that go on here. So if you don't go to these schools and you criticize them, a lot of them will say, Oh, you're just bitter because you didn't get in. Like, uh -huh. that's just, that's just I how they think. That. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've gotten that. A lot of people like, yeah. So so that's just how they think. Like, oh, this like this person is just like bitter or they weren't good enough or whatever. Like they, that's just the way that their minds work. They're a lot, not a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, unfortunately, you know, they also have a prepared defense for if you do sort of go to one of these schools and launch criticisms at them and ridicule them and try to point out some of their flaws the way that I do. And what they what they do in this case is they'll say, well, you're just a hypocrite. Like you went to this school too. Like, oh, here you are sort of railing against elites. Well, aren't you an elite? Didn't you go to one of these schools, man? Like, and so they have like these prepared defense mechanisms in place so that they never have to accept criticism. But in the second case, they are sort of once, once they sort of drop that initial um, defense, then they, they sometimes, not always, but they are sometimes more willing to accept that kind of criticism. Once I, what, like, so what I do, and I point out to them, like, yeah, okay, but like, you know, just like, just because you enter somewhere doesn't mean that you can't criticize. Like, okay, so if you, if you get a job at Goldman Sachs, and then you criticize Goldman Sachs, does that make you a hypocrite? Or can you still like point out reasonable flaws of, of that institutions or that organization? So, so anyway, um, yeah, I mean, all this is to say that like, a lot of those people deserve criticism. And in some cases, they won't accept it unless they're hearing it from like a quote unquote, someone who sort of went to the same school or them or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that I think that's, that's, that's really interesting. I guess I want to close with your, your whole, I guess your outlook on life. You know, mm -hmm. um, I watched your pod, I watched your podcast with Jordan Peterson. Um, mm -hmm. The podcast, by the way, um, if you want to go to Jordan Peterson's show, is called uh, Sex and Dating Apps. Um, and we haven't talked about any of that right now, but, which shows your range, by the way. It's great. Um, it seems like in your view, and I'm just saying this based on what I've listened to, but it seems like in your view, there's kind of a winner's take all mentality in a lot of these the institutions that you see, that is, those who are at the top of the sexual hierarchy get all the mates. Those who are at the top of the educational hierarchy get all the opportunities. Those who are at top of whatever hierarchy get all of whatever is there. And do you ever step back and say, well, what if I'm not there? What if I'm not at the top? You know, how, how do I find meaning in life? How do I find status? How do I find prestige? I mean, what do you, what do you see? It seemed, this seems like a very sort of fatalistic view. Oh, I mean, I, I've i never heard my views characterized that way. So I, I hope that that's not the impression I'm giving. Um, I, I definitely don't hold those beliefs in, in this sort of like, you know, that there's a winner take all environment and for, for any of those things. Um, I certainly don't think that's the way they, things should be. Uh, in some cases, it can be uh, in sort of narrow domains, the way things are. Um, and that's also sort of, you know, useful to keep in mind to mitigate against that. But, um, yeah, I, I think there are many ways to, to find success in life. It doesn't necessarily have to just be in, in terms of education or, or in terms of how much money you have or whatever, like how many people you sleep with. Um, there are many, many sort of routes to a fulfilling life. But a lot of my writing, because it's sort of focused on um, criticizing what I see among, among you know, certain, certain elites anyway, is is that they are like very much in in a sort of mindset of striving for success in in, in terms of like the sort of narrow definition of success in terms of like professional success mostly um getting that next job or whatever like you know internship you know law school getting the right job sort of hitting those benchmarks living in the right neighborhoods all of those kinds of things um but so much research indicates that those are not the things that that sort of 
make for long term happiness. Um, I've I've looked into a lot of the sort of psychology of happiness research, and it's a pretty consistent finding that you know, sort of beyond a certain level of 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 income or sort of material comfort, it more doesn't actually increase your happiness by that much. Um, of course, like once you get like super rich, it does like weird things start to happen in terms of your happiness. But by and large, like, you know, once you reach a certain level of material comfort, sort of this hedonic adaptation kicks in and you sort of get used to it. Um, and so if you measure the happy, the day to day happiness of a very rich person and a sort of middle class person who's, who's, you know, has enough their, their day to day happiness isn't that different. Um, but things that do actually have like long-term impacts on happiness are things like our relationships, our sort of sense of community, neighborliness. Um, you know, there's, there's research showing, for example, that being married has the same effect on your happiness as earning an extra hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, Hmm. and so, you know, on the one hand you can like sort of work earning an extra hundred thousand dollars a year has no correlation with happiness. Well, well, so, so if you have like a certain, like whatever, like if you have a certain increase, um, it does. And, and again, like, so, so I guess how do I put this making a, making more money doesn't have a big increase on your happiness, but, but making like large amounts more can have noticeable increases. So if you suddenly earn a hundred thousand dollars more per year, it will have a noticeable increase, but maybe not as huge as you might think. Um, Whereas I think a lot of people believe that if they were to get a raise of a hundred thousand dollars, it would sort of transform their world or something. Um, But so anyway, so getting a hundred thousand dollars more per year and getting married have roughly the same effect. Um, uh, Having a, having a, having a close friend that you, that you're in contact with all the time, that's worth a hundred thousand dollars a year in terms of happiness. So basically like if you're married and you have a good friend, like this is sort of like making like a really good living in terms of like how, how strong of an effect it has on your happiness. Um, other things are sort of having, having children, having a family. Um, and so, so basically the, the re- research seems to indicate I that relationships and religion. And so, yeah, so I was getting to that. So religion is another one. Um, there was a finding, I can't remember the, the source. Um, I can send it to you if you're going to like links show notes or whatever, but basically found that yeah, if you're in the, the bottom, uh, socioeconomic quartile, um, attending a religious service weekly has the same effect on your happiness as moving to the top, uh, income quintile or quartile rather. Uh, and so, so there are like all of these other sort of routes to living a fulfilling life besides trying to like maximize your earnings. Right. And so, so, you know, in terms of like the cumulative effect, it can actually have like a pretty big increase. So you were saying before, well, I thought a hundred thousand dollars doesn't have an effect. It's a small effect, right? But if you have marriage, you have a close friend, you have a, you live in a good neighborhood and you know, the people who live around you, you attend a religious service. Like in terms of like the, uh, the cumulative impact of that suddenly, like this is like starting to look like a really uh, happy and fulfilling life. Or you can sort of work yourself to, to the boat and try to get that next promotion and try to fulfill your happiness that way. Um, And it is possible. So this is the other thing is that like people like you and me who sort of can find a way to um, sort of seek fulfillment through our our professions or through our occupations, um, not everyone can do that. So this is a point that I make in, in one of my luxury beliefs articles is that the vast majority of Americans don't go to college. They don't have quote unquote professions. They have jobs, right? They work nine to five. They get paid by the hour. Um, you know, they, they basically don't have this kind of job where you can sort of like indulge your creativity or your passion or your, or, or even just like, maybe if you don't enjoy your job that much, at least you're getting paid really well. Most people don't have those kinds of jobs. So how do those kinds of people live fulfilling lives? And I think like in, in those cases, relationships become um, all the more important. And it's, it's just sad that like, I think a lot of our elites are not promoting that idea. It's, it's much more about like, get everyone to go to college, get a, get a better job, make more money, buy more things. And, and that's not necessarily the the best path for 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 most people. Yeah, well, it's it's um, and, and by the way, I had no intention of like uh, trying to characterize your beliefs in any kind of cynical way. I just mean to say, like, um, like for example, when you talked about Tinder, for example, and you were like, well, the uh, the alpha male, one of my friends got like ten thousand matches on Tinder and stuff like that because he was of a certain height, a certain income bracket, a certain race, 
um, and, and you know, like, he's, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, and, you and say hi. so successful. I think that's yeah. how you describe it. And I was like, eh, is that really successful? I mean, in the end, you can only choose one. Well, well, or, success in terms of, in terms of like what, whatever the game happens to be on Tinder, which I think a lot of people think of that as successful, right? Is like sort of how many, how many hookups you can get. Right. So it's like not success in like the broader meaning of the term, but in this narrowly defined, like how many matches can you get? I think a lot of, at least a lot of guys, a y- young men would say like, that's, you know, that's sort of a measure of success. Um, it's funny I, I, I have to yeah. believe that women yeah. are wise to this game on Twitter too. I mean, do women not understand Tinder? You mean? I mean, on on what did I say? Uh, whatever, Twitter, Tinder. Yeah. Women, women, Twitter. <laughs> well, I have to believe that women on Tinder are wise have gotten wise to this game too. Like, I can't imagine they really take seriously the idea that they can mate with this extremely high status person just by messaging them on twitter when this person probably gets like 500 messages a week or something like that you know uh, uh yeah yeah i mean that's yeah i i know much less about the sort of female experience on on these apps but i would imagine they are many of them are very wise to how guys tend to tend to sort of interact with with uh, with tinder and all these other apps and, and well, what's ultimately going on i think tinder functionally speaking is useless because it's just I know that there are isolated cases where people actually develop relationships from there, but I think the the structures are so disproportionate or like are so out of whack that I think much of it is a waste of time. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. So like at the individual level that may be the case, but then like there's there's so much research now on how people end up meeting, you know, sort of uh, millennials and Gen Z and it is like most most couplings or most most relationship pairings when you ask people like how did you meet the majority of them or at least a plurality of them say that they meet through through uh apps or through online yeah um it's gotten to the point like i mean i talk to young guys now and and i mean how old are you kenny 24 20 yeah so so like yeah i talk to guys your age and like you know younger and and a lot of them it seems like so it's funny, like back in the day, like when I was sort of just starting to go out and whatever, um, it was still kind of weird to meet someone on, through online. Like Tinder had just sort of started coming up and like whatever, but like meeting someone through the internet was a weird thing in terms of dating. Like, how did you meet this person? Oh, I met them through a dating website. It was kind of like this weird, embarrassing thing. And meeting someone in person was sort of like the normal way either through friends or maybe meeting at a bar or whatever, a library or a coffee shop or something was normal. And today, it seems like at least when I talk to young guys, and you can tell me what your impression is, is that it's flipped to where now the normal way of meeting is through apps or through online somehow. And if you meet someone in person, it's almost considered like this sort of weird, exotic, maybe not creepy, but it's just sort of like, whoa, that's like weird. You met someone in person and they ask you out. Yeah. Well, you know, um, it seems more convenient for people to meet online. I mean, it's definitely more convenient for people to meet online, but I I ultimately think it's more courageous for a person to approach somebody in person. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I think that there's, I mean, the reason being is because, you know, it, it requires a certain level of moxie that, you know, people have had to develop in the past that now they can just hide behind a phone and a screen and way of doing it. I don't know. Maybe I'm just defending grandstanding masculinity. Who knows? <laughs> wait, wait, what but, is this? Uh, offending grandstanding? <laughs> what is defending this? Defending grandstanding masculinity. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To- well, toxic masculinity. Yeah, I yeah, mean, toxic. I think there's, you know, I think it's it's tough. I mean, the whole situation now, the, the dating scene is is getting pretty, you know, I don't know. I, I agree with you. I think a, a lot of the dating apps, uh the the culture around them is creating uh sort of more more toxicity between between the sexes and and like the ways that people think about relationships and yeah it's 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 interesting because like when they were initially created it was supposed to make life easier right it was supposed to um i'm sure like whoever in silicon valley decided to create these kinds of apps were thinking like oh we're helping people meet in a people who are busy people who don't have time to date or whatever we're we're creating something not everyone has to use them right like if you want to use it you can but if you don't want to you don't have to but it became so uh it proliferated and became like such a large part of the culture that like now something like 75 percent of people under 30 are have used the apps at least once or at least downloaded it at least once and 
And now it's like, uh, if, if you look at sort of the relationship patterns, like, you know, fewer people have been in relationships, like more people, to, uh, more women, at least, I don't know about men, but more women today say that dating has gotten harder than it was 10 years ago. Um, and then, yeah, if, if you look at the the numbers of, of young men who report not having sex in the last year, like that's, that's, I think, tripled since or in the last 10 years. And so, yeah, like relationships, sex, like all of these things have actually been deteriorating as these, these apps have, have um, sort of uh, proliferated. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, Rob, this has been such an amazing conversation, very enlightening, very diverse. Um, you know, I'd love to keep talking with you at some point, but um, why don't you let us know how your listeners, the listeners of this podcast can follow you? Yeah, you can uh, follow me on Twitter at Rob K. Henderson, and my website is robkhenderson.com. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much for being on, Rob. Yeah, thanks, Kenny.